Learn all about amputation surgery and recovery for dogs and prosthetics as an option for full limb amputation in this complete CE approved lecture presented by veterinary orthopedic expert, Dr. Sherman Knapp on this episode of Tripod Talk Radio. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Sherman Knapp. I'm a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons as well as a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation where I'm the past president. I'm Director of National Regenerative Medicine, Rehabilitation, and Sports Medicine for Pathway Vet Alliance. I'm co-founder with my wife, Dr. Deborah Knapp, of the Veterinary Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Group and founder and president of Orthobiologics Innovation, which is a translational medicine company taking products from humans to animals and animals to humans. Project Go is a nonprofit organization helping working dogs, rescue organizations, and wildlife. It's a 501c3 that we started many years ago. And lastly, Canap Sports Medicine is a virtual medicine, virtual sports medicine for veterinarians, for owners with telemedicine, teleeducation, wall of fame and products. Today, we're gonna to be talking about tripods and prosthetics, how to care for our three-legged friends. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the two sponsors you see here from this talk. I'd like to also share this, a little bit of comic relief. Stubby in his magic boots, keep calm, and faux pas. Now what's really, really important is that we understand when we're talking about the use of these types of devices, it's absolutely extremely important that we think about proper owner and patient case selection Exact measurements and fitting, rehab and client education are absolutely paramount for the best success. Just placing a device on your canine companion is not the silver bullet. So the objectives of this webinar is to talk about subtotal amputations. We'll also talk about full amputations and prosthesis as an alternative to full limb amputations and options for full limb amputations as well. We'll look at case selection, surgical approaches, prosthesis, fabrication in the post-op care, complications that can occur with these, rehabilitation therapy. We'll also talk about a retrospective analysis that we published many years ago. So limb salvage, prosthesis, why would we have to consider such a procedure for your canine companion? Well, let's talk about neoplasia and severe trauma, common causes for amputation. Now, giant breeds or dogs with concurrent orthopedic disease may respond poorly to amputation. Therefore, a forelimb and a hind limb prosthesis may offer an alternative to full limb amputations. Now, when it comes to prosthetics, They've been around for a long, long time. The earliest record of limb prosthesis was way back in 484 BC. It was a Persian soldier who has his foot amputated or had his foot amputated and replaced with a wooden prosthesis that you can see here in this image. We've come a long, long way though, as you can see here in the bottom right from that wooden foot to where we are with current prosthetics. When we talk about prosthesis in the veterinary space, there's a few different types we can think about. There's transcutaneous intraosseous. And what this means is that we're actually performing the amputation and then taking an implant, placing it up inside the bone so it's being firmly attached either through what's called a press fit or through bone cement. And you can see those two images to the left versus what we see on the right, which is what's called an external self-suspending prosthetic. Now, when it comes to the transcutaneous intraosseous, there are some benefits. There's no need for prosthetic adjustments. There's improved energy efficiency during the gait, improved proprioception, lack of skin breakdown, and lack of on-off prosthetics. And this was published back in 2008. You do have some issues though as well where there's implant infection, there's periprosthetic fractures that can occur, there's a lack of strength between where the implant and the skin is. The skin just cannot, and soft tissues grow into these implants. If we're talking about external self-suspension, there's many benefits there. Easy application and removal, less complicated surgery with no implants, no chance of infected in implants, no chance of periprosthetic fractures. If a patient does not tolerate the prosthesis, 
it's simply left off with a stump amputation, and we'll take a look at that a bit later. There's no need for prosthetic adjustments, and skin irritation are two of the things we have to consider. Now with the prosthesis, there's a suspension system. So every prosthetic requires some type of suspension system to keep it from falling off the residual limb. There's a suspension system that includes self-suspension of the socket, suction suspension, and suspension devices or harnesses, as you'll see here in a second. So with the self-suspension of the socket, this makes the use of an anatomic shape of the residual limb, such as what you can see here with this elephant. With a suction suspension, it's a method of creating suction suspension by the use of a suction socket design and gel suspension liner. With a suspension device harness, it requires belts or cuffs or wedges, straps and sleeves. So somehow we're applying the prosthesis to the distal extremity or the limb where the amputation was performed. And then we're holding it in place here, as you can see, with some sort of harness type apparatus. So why would we have to consider these things such as external self-suspension prosthesis? Well, here's a great example of one. This is Ebony. And Ebony is an absolutely wonderful patient, um, but unfortunately has some other issues, has elbow dysplasia, elbow arthritis, also hip dysplasia. And all of a sudden this tumor formed literally overnight, practically, according to these owners. And Ebony was having a real challenge ambulating or walking around with this tumor, of course. The worry was that we would not be able to remove this tumor and get clean margins. So unfortunately, our only option for a mass that was this large was to perform an amputation. Now, Ebony was an 11-year-old female spade lab, and this was a hemangioparasitoma. So we knew we had to get margins, but Ebony, with her issues of elbow arthritis, hip arthritis, and her age, we knew we had to do something to add some support to this limb. So in surgery, what you have to do is make sure you have margins so you don't leave any of the cancer behind, but you have to preserve as much bone and as much of the healthy soft tissues as you can. So it's a fairly challenging, complicated procedure, but we in the veterinary space can follow what they use in humans. Following the procedure, you can see the stump. Now, the suture line, this was one of our earlier cases. You want to try to avoid the suture line being at the very end of the stump because that does apply pressure with the bandage, with the splint, with the compression sleeve and device we're going to put on here temporarily, as well as with the prosthetic device. So the future ones that we have done have all had the incision closure higher up the limb from where the amputation site was performed. Following the procedure, they tend to want to swell a little bit. They can have some drainage, some edema. So it's important that we stay on top of that very quickly. So what we'll use is a combination of adjustable cold therapy and active pneumatic compression, which through a microprocessor regulates through a control unit. Now, this control unit is filled with ice and water, and then you wrap this securely around the limb, and this is a great device for allowing for this cold therapy or cryotype therapy. Now with that, we want to make sure that we maintain post-op reduction of swelling because if we do not, um, we cannot do the cast mold for the prosthetic until the swelling is down. So cast molding is preferably performed somewhere between 7 to 10 days post-op. Um, we're going to allow for immediate swelling to reduce, and that can be with our cryotherapy. It can also be with a bandage, compression wrap, um, and we want to get that prosthesis on as quickly as possible, usually by two weeks if we can, because the longer they go without it, they start to become aware, hey, you know what, I can get around without this, and it's harder to get them to accept it and to ambulate with it. No need to minimize the time from post-op to the prosthesis. So we need to actually take, or need to minimize, sorry, the time from post-op to prosthesis just to get incisions to heal, swelling to go down, and of course the prosthesis fabricated. So this is an example. You saw Ebony, and we immediately made the cast mold from Ebony's um, limb. This was sent off for fabrication, carbon fiber, um, plastic type insert. Um, you can see it's a polypropylene with a strap on the inside that will go around the stump. 
So here's an example of ebony. Now this was a few weeks after the procedure. Again, we don't just place this on and say, okay, go for a walk in the, in the grass and the leaves. This is working very closely with the rehabilitation therapists, also with the owners to get ebony introduced to this device. And after you know placing it on, you have them just stand there with it static. Then you have them take a few steps. Then you take it off. You know you do slow introductions of these types of devices so that they're not overwhelmed and they get comfortable. And you can make sure that there's no complications as far as rubbing and that is fitting appropriately. Now we're stepping off a curb. Okay, that stayed on, which is always a good sign. Um, you can see we just sniffed a bag. Our little sniffer is still working. Now the most challenging thing is can they ambulate? and navigate stairs. So here's an example of Ebony with our first stairs. So not too bad, okay? Again, this is gonna take some work, it's gonna take some training, it's gonna take patience, but again, the right patient and the right owner. So for these prosthetics that we're going to be looking at, there's two orthotists that we work with. Um, one is Derek Campana um, from Animal Ortho Care, and the other is Jeff Collins from Canine Orthotics and Prosthetics. I get asked commonly, what's the range? And this is just a ballpark, but for many of these that we'll be looking at, they range somewhere uh, for the actual device itself between the upper hundreds to low thousand dollar range. And this is going to be um, U.S. Complications. Unfortunately, these can occur. Um, it happens in humans, it happens in animals. And so it's really, really important education, education, education with the owner um, that they know what to look for. So we got to make sure with the wounds, is it a question with the fit? Is it a question with a mold? Remember, we're creating a mold and sending it off to have this fabricated. And if our mold wasn't exact, then the product we're going to get back in place of it is not going to be exact either. Could we have pressure points? Is there a lack of padding somewhere within the device? Um, owner and patient compliance. Did the dog go swimming with this device on? Did it go running around the yard chasing squirrels? Um, was there not a good enough break-in period or, or long enough break-in period? So some of the remedies that we can have, we can place what's called a surge sock or it's like a little sock that goes over top of it. We can add some extra padding within the prosthesis. Um, remodeling. So if it's just not fitting, we recast, we send it back to the orthotist. Or sometimes we actually just have to have some minor adjustments to the current mold by the orthotist. Another thing you can use is a talc type powder. So you can place that down inside if there's some rubbing. You can also use a Telfa pad as well. Now I get asked quite commonly, it seems like the surgery is fairly technical and complicated. It seems like the immediate post-op period is very, very crucial to get the swelling down, protect the incision. But what then goes through as far as the process of actually getting these types of prosthetics created? And getting them back because you know, it's really important that we get this thing molded appropriately accurately precisely and sent back as readily as possible so we can start introducing it to the patient so the fabrication process first thing we're going to do is take a soft cast material this is a 3m material just so you can see the stump and i'm not bringing the cut strip to the and so we have a good picture of the distal edge of the stump. It's also important to flex the hock to help distribute the pressure from the, the end of the stump to the back. That usually helps with pressure distribution and sores. See. So yeah, I'm manually flexing the hock. Like so. Almost. <laughs> it's 
60 seconds. Good job, I'll see. All right, then what's the next step? So you could saw that was Derek Campana, an orthotist from Northern Virginia um, that we work with very, very closely and frequently. And what you saw was that was the cast mold of the, what we call distal extremity, which is the area of the stump. And now what's gonna happen is he slides off that cast mold. He's gonna take it back to his shop and then he's gonna go through a step-by-step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step -by -step process. It's fairly technical to actually create the final device. So Derek was kind enough to uh, to walk us through this uh, this process. So we have the mold that's shipped to the orthotist. In this case, it's gonna be with Derek Campana. And then what we have here is we have duct tape to seal the mold and we're gonna stabilize this um, in a sandbox. The next thing that's gonna happen is you mix your plaster of Paris and you have a rebar that's placed to uh, reinforce the, uh, the, uh, the device. Now this plaster of Paris will set up within about five minutes to one hour, okay? We have to wait, it's fairly uh, variable as to how long it takes before it gets solid. Then the cast molds are ready for plastic application. So you can see here, this was the mold that was placed um, inside the cast um, made from plaster of Paris. So it's almost like a reverse mold, if you would. Next, what you're gonna do is you're heating the sheet of plastic mold in an oven. So this comes as a firm type plastic material. Once you heat it, it's malleable. So you can see here then what they've done, or Derek's done, is he's taken that plastic mold once he's heated it and wrapped it around the cast mold that he created with the Pastor Polaris. Then he's gonna do a heating transfer um, of the paper. And what you do then is you actually apply um, the transfer paper. So you can see here, that was the plastic material, the mold, and then this is gonna be the uh, transfer paper applied now over top of the actual device. And there's all different types of transfer papers. Um, you name it, it, it really depends on uh, you know, your personal choice as to uh, the different ones that you would want for your, for your pet. So then you're gonna cut the foam interface and you're gonna apply the thread to the rocker bottom of the foot, okay? So now we're talking about the portion that they actually walk on, okay? So this is what they call the rocker bottom. And you can see there's little kind of grips on the bottom of that foot as well. So then you apply the shank and the rocker bottom uh, foot to the shell. Okay, so you can see the little foot portion at the bottom. There is what we call the, the shank area. It's a metal um, bar basically, and it's then going to attach to the actual plastic mold. And then that's sent back and applied to the patient. Now that was for what we call a partial amputation. Okay, partial uh, limb amputation, whether it's a forelimb or a hind limb. Now what we're going to look at is a prosthetic for a full forelimb amputation. And we're going to take you through that process.
All right, so you could see then that it's come a long way. Everything from the actual cast mold, which was able to be able to be created around this, this patient's body, they were able to then use a software to scan that. Then they were able to take that, input it into 3D modeling or 3D rendering to get the final material that was 3D printed. And because of that, it fits absolutely perfect to the mold, which fits absolutely perfect to the patient. So it now appears that we can do this with 3D modeling, um, get them extremely accurate. And before we really weren't able to do prosthetics for any patients that had complete limb amputations. And now you can see in this particular patient that we're able to actually apply a prosthesis to a forelimb that's been fully amputated. Follow-up care. Okay, so we've placed the prosthesis. Um, we slowly start to introduce it to the patient. Um, we're gonna assess it for fit. We're gonna train the client, okay, about the procedures of putting it on, taking it off, watching, dealing with the skin, the soft tissues, training on proper care of the device, monitoring for limb fit, any trauma to the skin, if there's rubbing. Imagine if you put a pair of shoes on that just don't quite fit and you go for a run, all of a sudden you're gonna have blisters. And if you don't take them off, but you have a blister, it can actually wear its way all the way down to the level of the bone. And we can see that unfortunately in patients that have these that weren't monitored or didn't fit appropriately. Um, initial break-in schedule, all right, you place it on, you just get them used to it, introduce it, take it off, okay? Put it on, have them stand for a minute, take it off. Put it on, have them take a few steps. So again, it's a very, very slow process getting them introduced and used to it and a recheck schedule with the rehabilitation therapist. So for the external self-suspension prosthesis, there is the, the ambulation phase. So it's a break-in of the prosthesis. We'll do cold laser, manage the skin for any wounds, joint for soreness, any trigger points, manual therapy, range of motion, tension. Because again, we're not just dealing with the area that's been amputated, we're dealing with the whole body because we're affecting the chain and we're affecting everything from the forelimb to the hind limb, nose to the tail. So we really have to think of the whole body and whole body health. We're gonna aid in biomechanics. This can be with TheraBands, with booties, underwater and land treadmill to help them get used to using it um, and start to build their mechanics and function, maintaining muscle go. mass, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is so important. Here we go. So strengthening phase. This is something where we wanna address functional and compensatory issues. We wanna address any muscle atrophy. And there's all sorts of things we can do. And, and with what you're seeing here with underwater treadmill, what happens is it takes the weight off the body, okay, and therefore you have a improvement in buoyancy, so they're basically able to go around the water a little easier. You have the viscosity of it and neuro re-education. What about hind limb? Okay, so we just looked at the fabrication for one for the forelimb. Let's look at a hind limb amputation. Now this is a one and a half year old Great Dane. Okay, really, really young dog. This is a juvenile osteosarcoma case, um, unfortunately. And uh, you can see the swelling and, and boy, they can come up very, very rapidly. And so we're gonna be looking at an external self-suspension prosthesis for the hind limb. Again, surgical planning is absolutely crucial. We need to make sure we get margins or we've placed this poor patient through a procedure um, only to find out that we really have not done justice. It's also important, of course, that they've taken thoracic or chest radiographs to look for any signs of metastasis many times. Um, recommendation is to do a CT scan, which can see um, METs in the chest that we can't appreciate on radiographs. We wanna make sure we've already in advance talked to the oncologist if chemotherapy is gonna be something that we follow up with, which of course is gonna um, be recommended, especially if we're looking at trying to improve long-term survival. Um, we need to make sure that we plan this appropriately, that we leave enough soft tissue, A, for the closure of the wound of the surgical site, but also to make sure we have soft tissue coverage that is adequate for the application of the prosthesis. So in this patient's uh, situation, the procedure was performed, um, and now you can see we have a compressive wrap on there, again, trying to decrease um, any swelling, edema, bruising, drainage that could come from that site. If we don't stay on top of that, it takes us longer to be able to get the prosthetic onto the limb. 
So here's an example of a patient that had a partial hind limb uh, amputation. You can see the prosthesis is on. Now this patient's been working with a rehab therapist and we're to the point where we're fairly comfortable. You can see we're gonna to start to go almost into a trot here, um, using it fairly well. All right, another situation. Okay, this is one where it was due to trauma. So we're gonna be talking about a suction suspension. This is a five-year-old female spay German Shepherd, wonderful dog, incredible owners. Unfortunately, this dog was hit by a car many, many years ago, it had a left tarsus and Paul severe trauma. They amputated the right um, limb. And, uh, and what you're gonna see is there was a pelvic fracture. You can see here in the x-rays down to the left, um, hip fracture. Um, and then we have this stump that you can see on the right side. Um, this is on the left hind limb. So now this is a see how collapsed her other hawk is. Oh, wow. Well. Can I excuse you to go a little walk down there? It's hard for me to put her exactly where you want her. You can see how collapsed her other hawk is. So just like before, we're gonna be making a mold, okay? So we take a stockinette or a little stock type, sock type material, place it over top of that, use a harder material to create the cast mold sent off, and then we'll have the device brought back and applied to the, to the limb. And so here we have a sock and a gel insert that will go over top of the stump. What I actually do is slightly different. What I do is I do a slight. That's great. That's great. So what you're looking at here was the patient going down a long pressure mat, and this is called an objective gait analysis. In other words, we wanna make sure that the patient is placing the right amount of weight on that limb. If not, is it because it's not the right fit? Is it because it's uncomfortable? Um, so we wanna make sure that we're seeing objectively with data that the limb is working functionally. So there is sensors within this mat. And as the patient walks down it, it gives us a weight distribution. It gives us stride length and step length. And most dogs, it's a 60-40 ratio. That means 60% of their weight's up front, of course, because of their deep chest, and 40% is in the back. So each forelimb should be carrying 30-30, and each hind limb should be carrying 20-20. So when we look at the data, we should see fairly even left to right in the fronts, left to right in the rear. So if you look here, what we're doing is we're loading the forelimb a bit and we're not placing as much weight on the left hind limb, which is the one with the prosthesis, that we could be, okay? So this is gonna be something where we're gonna make some adjustments and now all of a sudden you can see here, 22. Okay, so we've actually put more pressure now, the loading that we should be seeing on that limb. So if we start to get rubbing, you can see here the image to the right, they're starting to get some little um, ulcerations, irritation to the skin, dermatitis from the device rubbing. Um, we gotta make sure, was it the fit? Was it not an ample padding? Had the padding moved? Um, rotate the prosthetic out to avoid any contralateral limb uh, during the amputation. So we need to make sure that we're seeing, you know, changes not occur just to the limb that was amputated. We gotta watch the opposite leg as well to make sure we're not seeing any compensatory issues. So here we can go ahead and take the surge sock. We can take a um, little kind of um, molding type material, almost like a, uh, we call it a stockinette apply that over top of the area, add some extra padding. Worst case scenario, we can do remodeling uh, by the orthotist or some adjustments may be needed by the orthotist. And we talked earlier about applying a Telfa pad or some talc pad or, or even a Neosporin triple antibiotic ointment to any areas where there's some wounds. So what about maintenance? 
Okay, we've talked a lot about patient selection. We've talked a lot about the procedure. We've talked a lot about how we make it, how we place it, the importance of the rehab afterwards and, and teaching them to uh, become adjusted to the device. What do I mean by supplements? Okay, because we've performed potentially a partial amputation or even a full amputation. But if you think about it, as we know, the weight distribution, as we saw in that last gait analysis, is shifted to other areas of the body. And that dog that we just saw a second ago, more weight was shifted up front to the forelimbs. Well, that means with more biomechanical load to these other joints, we could see some early arthritis, progress in arthritis. We could see some soft tissue compensation, breakdown of soft tissues. So we need to think of full body maintenance when it comes to long-term maintenance of these patients that have had partial amputations or full amputations. So the first thing we think about is joint supplements. Imagine if your hind limb is amputated, you're putting your weight to the forelimbs as a dog, to the opposite leg as a dog, um, and so therefore they're gonna have those challenges. If it was a partial amputation and they're not putting the amputated limb through full range of motion, okay, because they've had a stump and the, the socket above or the joint spaces above aren't maintaining or needing to do full range of motion, Anytime a joint is slightly immobilized or increase load or traumatize, they get over time arthritis. And so we want to do things to support the joints, slow down the progression of arthritis to the best of our ability. So things like glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, ASU. Um, this is something where the Dasaquin product, you can see at the bottom of the screen, is one that we like to use in our patients, whether they've had an amputation or even just for any other orthopedic condition. And we do like the one that has MSM in there as well. So this is a glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, avocado, soybean, unsaponifiable with MSM type product. And there's even more ingredients that they've added most recently. So a wonderful product. Um, there is data out there with this product showing that it does work for the canine um, for arthritis. Another product that's absolutely proven, great data that I really, really believe in when it comes to whole body wellness, especially if we're talking about in these situations where we're worried about loading the joints and the soft tissues, is the fish oils or omega-3s. My preference is the Wellactin product. Um, this is something that's easy to apply to the dog food. Um, they, they really do tolerate the taste of this. Um, it's easier to get the concentration you need. It's really hard to get the high concentration you need in some of the capsules, um, but you can in this liquid formation um, fairly easily. So another, comp another uh, ingredient is going to be added to our, uh, our maintenance dose will be our omega-3 fatty acids. A fairly new one is called 1-TDC, okay? This is another very, very important anti-inflammatory. It was first used for dental disease, and then they realized in the human patients that were using it for dental disease, all of a sudden their joints were feeling more comfortable. They were able to be more active, and they found out very quickly that this has not only an anti-inflammatory effect for periodontal disease, but also for joint inflammation, for myofascial pain, and, and a bunch of other conditions. So definitely one that if we have a patient that's had an amputation, um, we're gonna be using this for whole body health. Absolutely, I think one of the most important supplements you can use is one called myos. And, and I'll explain why. When you perform an amputation, okay, especially if we're trying to keep a prosthesis on, we will start to see muscle atrophy, okay? We need to do anything in our power to try to maintain muscle mass and function of that stump or that limb. We also may not be as active as a dog because of the fact that we are three-legged or we have a prosthesis, and we may start to atrophy other locations. So for these dogs, even prior to the procedure, I go ahead and I start these patients on myos, which is a canine muscle formulation. They do have this for humans as well. It's called YOT. And uh, there is a ton of research. And this is just examples of some of the papers. You can go to Google Scholar or PubMed and find these. Um, but one at Kansas State University really was impressive. This was in the canine after knee surgeries, and they were able to maintain and increase their muscle mass compared to a placebo-controlled um, patient group. So definitely something myos is one that we recommend. Aside from the joint supplements, your glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, avocado, soya, and saponifiable, your, your uh, dasquin product with MSM, your omega-3s, your 1-TDC, your myos, we also need to think about protecting the other limbs in soft tissues, not just the joints. So what do I mean by that? Well, we saw that the weight distribution was increased in other limbs 
after the amputation. And this is an example here in the center where you can see a carpal hyperextension, meaning that the front leg, the wrist, is starting to drop towards the ground. All those soft tissues are carrying more load than they're used to carrying, and therefore they can start to stretch out, they can start to break down. So not only are we gonna have some potential arthritic changes in that joint, we're also going to have some soft tissue challenges. So we need to do something to try to protect these joints. The first is gonna be our supplements we talked about. Rehabilitation therapy is crucial. And also orthopedic devices are something that can help with maintaining normal function ambulation and protect those soft tissues. So this is a neoprene carpal wrap. It's called a carpo wrap. It's by Therapol. And what you'll also see is there is a thermoplast or plastic insert in the backside. Depending on the size of the dog and depending on the, the amount of weight they're placing up front and the amount of breakdown that we're seeing, sometimes it's just the light neoprene wrap, sometimes it's just an even lighter sports wrap, or sometimes if it's a really heavy dog and they're really loading the forelimb and we're seeing breakdown, we will add this plastic thermoplast insert that we can cast mold. Um, we kind of take a piece of, uh, it's a plastic type material, you heat it up, it becomes malleable, and then you apply it so it's the right standing angle for that particular type of breed or canine. So we spent a lot of time looking at these devices and they look pretty cool and the whole process seems pretty involved, but do they actually work? Okay, do they work in dogs the way that we see that they work in humans? So we wanted to answer that question and we published a paper years ago looking at the outcome measures of how these patients did after we performed these partial amputations and applied an external canine limb prosthesis. And these were 24 patients that we had followed out. The conclusion of the paper was that we did see improved quality of life and that this was something that as an alternative to full amputation or other limb spared surgical procedures, you could consider a partial amputation. So let's look at the study. So there were 76 cases that we looked at. They ranged from nine weeks to 15 years of age. Um, mean and medium was right around four. Weight anywhere from four pounds all the way up to 155 pounds. Um, you can see here the mean being about 61, 59 pounds. When it came to the different breeds, all different breeds, you can see coon hound, mixed breeds, beagles, rottweilers, um, basset hounds, um, South African. I mean, it's uh, domestic short hairs thrown in there, border collies. Um, you name it, it seems like we have performed, unfortunately, an amputation or a partial amputation in these patients or these types of breeds. So then what we did is we sent out a survey to these owners that had these procedures performed and were in these prostheses for partial amputations. And of those that were able to get back to us of the 20, and again, it's challenging, even though we've had 70 some cases, um, to always get the, the surveys back. Um, we got 20 of them back and that's a good margin for, for surveys in our industry. And we could see of those patients, age range was five months to 12 years, mean being about 3.8, medium about 1.75. Here, the weight range again, very light, four pounds, all the way up to 155 pounds, with our mean being right around 61, 62. So of these 20 cases, Golden Lab Boxer Maltese, a mix of 25%, Pitts, Border Collie, the South African, English Mastiff, Shallow Shepherd, Giant Schnauzer, German Shepherd. You can see here the female to male ratio. You can see the how many were altered or spayed and neutered compared to how many were intact. Reasons for the need for a partial amputation in the prosthesis. Okay, this is something where cancer, unfortunately, was 20% of these cases. Trauma was 40% of these cases. Something congenital, where they were born with some sort of defect uh, to their limb was 35 cases, and some other cause was 5%. Now, the survey was objective, and it was a survey in which we could actually follow the course of outcomes objectively over time following the application of the prosthesis. So the first question was, how long did it take your pet to get used to wearing the device? And we had a few that just never got used to the device. We had a bunch that were absolutely immediately. You could see some were one week, less were two weeks, less were three weeks, 
less for 16 weeks, okay? So it's, it varies. And that's something that comes with the education to the client that we're not just gonna put this on. The dog is going to absolutely get used to it and say, hey, let's go for a hike. Um, some of these dogs is gonna take some time and some will never get used to it. They just won't accept it. And that's important to realize because you're placing your patient or your, your canine companion through this procedure um, and you're going through the whole modeling device, um, the cascade of events that needs to occur in order to get the prosthesis sent back to you and applied. And there's gonna be a situation where certain ones just don't um, tolerate it, but it's always worth a try for those that you feel would be a good candidate. What activities could your pet do once they got used to wearing the prosthetic? Could they stand 90%? Could they walk 90%? Could they trot 85%? Could they climb stairs 75%? Jump on and off of the furniture? Not something I'd probably recommend, uh, but they were doing it 65%. And play fetch was actually 85% of these dogs once they were in a prosthetic. How well did the prosthetic fit? Poorly in a few, less than satisfactory acceptable, you can see good, excellent were the majority, okay? But those that were poorly or less than satisfactory, again, is something where did we lose muscle mass? Did we not have the proper cast molding to begin with? Did something shift? Did we need more padding? So there's all these things that we need to consider for those that just weren't doing what we needed them to do. Did the prosthetic slip? Yes, often in some of these cases. Yes, sometimes, no, very occasionally. And the no's, again, were the majority, but again, something that we need to make sure, was it a fabrication issue? Was it a padding issue? Did we lose muscle mass? You know, stay on top of that and, and see if we can improve it. After your pet got used to using the prosthetic, how well did your pet move in comparison to before? A few were worse. Some just could not get used to it. A few were no different. And actually you see these that were improved following the use of the prosthesis. Did the device break? There were ones that broke. Okay, this can be something with the fabrication. This could be something where the dog did jump off a bed and the bed was a very high bed. This could be something where he got it caught on something like a piece of furniture as he was running around in the house. Um, you can see though the majority did not break. Did the prosthetic meet your mobility expectations? Majority were yes. You can see some were no and some were somewhat. What were challenges met? You can see the highest one was the prosthetic slipping often, okay? So it's so important that you maintain it, that you check that the straps are adjusted, that it's fitting, that the padding isn't shifting, that it's adequately padded, that we haven't lost muscle mass. Refusing to use the limb, you can see in some of these, the prosthetic breaking in some of these as well. How would you rate your pet's quality of life before versus after prosthetic placement? You can see one, much worse than before. You can see five all the way up to much better than before. So the average right there in the center, you can see we're somewhere between much worse and much better, but we had quite a few that were much better than before as well. Again, there are always gonna be some, a few cases you can see here that just weren't able to get used to the device. Now, what about when it hits home? Okay, what do I mean by that? As an orthopedic surgeon and someone boarded in, in sports medicine and rehab, um, I see these cases commonly. We perform this procedure commonly. We get referrals from other surgeons around the country because it's a bit challenging and something that they may not have been trained in or feel comfortable with the entire process. So while I'm used to dealing with this from a surgical standpoint, from a client education standpoint, from a veterinary education standpoint, it's another thing when it hits home to one of your family members. Well, meet Armani. Armani is awesome. Armani is my daughter Allison's Great Dane, and she's had many Great Danes. And Armani is just one of the coolest dogs. And running, jumping, playing, nothing stops this dog. We go hiking, he goes kayaking. Um, and all of a sudden one day, Allie called me. She said, I just woke up this morning and it looks like the area around his hock or his ankle is swollen. And it wasn't like that last night. I was like, yeah, really? I'm like, did he slip or fall or, or, you know, spider bite or dog fight? Or, you know, did he get his leg caught on something? All the things we think about. No, none of those happened. You know, he was with me, went for a walk after, after dinner, went to bed, woke up this morning and that's how I found him. And he has a huge dog bed and he, you know, these, the giant breeze, as we all know, they like to curl up in their little ball and they just kind of chill for a while. Well, 
I said, well, go ahead, bring Armadi straight into work. And Allie works with me. She's actually my, my coordinator, my surgical coordinator. She helps to run Cannabis Sports Medicine. And so she brought Armani into the clinic. We took radio rest right away after we palpated. And it was, it was swollen. It was uncomfortable. It was firm to the touch. And you can see here on the x-rays, what we're looking at is that there are changes to the bone. So if we look higher up the, the x-rays of the tibia, this is the lower bone, the knees up higher in the x-ray, you can see how smooth the bone margin is. And all of a sudden, when we get down to the next joint space, which is the ankle or the hock, the bone is very remodeled. We would call some areas inside here a bit lytic, means it looks like a moth was there kind of chewing at it. A thing called periosteal reaction. So we can see all these changes in the bone surrounding that area. So what's happening here is the cancer cells are starting to break down the bone. The healthy cells are trying to lay down new bone and trying to fight the battle. And so the osteoclasts, unfortunately, the ones that turn bone over and break it down, are winning the battle compared to the osteoblast. And, and so we start to see the bone get larger from remodeling and proliferation, but also getting holes within it in areas that we call lytic or lysis. You can see that in the opposite x-ray over here. That was a side view to the left. To the right, it's a front view. And you can see darker areas in here. That's what we call lysis or areas where we're actually losing bone. So we went ahead and we performed a partial amputation on Armani. He's a huge Great Dane, um, and we wanted to see if we could go ahead, spare the remainder of the limb, and even consider a prosthesis for Armani if we felt it was going to be something that would be in, to his benefit. Now, luckily, his forelimbs are solid. His other hind limb is solid. No arthritis, no CCL injury, no challenge with any kind of breakdown, and this was very acute. We caught this very early. So this is the x-rays you can see right after the procedure. Okay, there's the stump. You can see this is the knee, that's above, that's the joint. And then you can see all the way down where we've actually made the cut in the bone and the soft tissues that surround it. Then what you can see six months after the amputation, you can see everything's remained the same. Um, we see no changes to the bone, okay? When we did the amputation, we did have clean margins, um, which was very, very important. Chest was clear as well. So this is Armani. This is right after the amputation. We use this thing called an IABAM. It's like a, um, it's a sticky type drape material that sticks to the skin. So there's a bandage down underneath that, adding a little compression, and then it's held in place by IABAM. The problem that we run into with many dogs, when you place an actual bandage on the leg, it falls off. You know, it can slip, it can slide, it can turn. So trying to get something to stick there, the IBM drape does a really nice job of that. So if you're going to have this procedure performed by your veterinarian, um, just mention this and feel free to share this talk or this slide with them. So here's Armani. This is six months after the amputation. Armani was in chemotherapy with an oncologist, um, but you can see here the stump. You know, we still have maintained very, very nice muscle mass. You can see the quads, you can see the hamstrings, even the distal stump area still has nice muscle mass. And again, we placed uh, Armani on Myos um, as well as the other supplements straight away, um, you know, after this procedure. And Armani was actually on the joint supplements, you know, since he was a pup, um, but the Myos we had just started at the time of this, uh, this condition. So we just, this past week, took Armani camping and celebrated Armani's ninth birthday. Now this was one year post amputation, okay? No signs of changes in the chest, no changes radiographically at the sign of the amputation or the stump. And Armani is still a super duper happy, healthy Great Dane who just loves life. You can see him here running on the beach. This was camping just this past weekend. Yes, it was 27 degrees at night. We were all in tents, and so Armani wasn't so happy about that. Uh, but just being out there hiking, running in the sand, um, you know, you, he doesn't know that he has three legs. What you're going to see, though, is he's using that other leg to balance. So a lot of veterinarians or surgeons may do a full limb amputation and not consider a partial even if you don't plan on placing a prosthetic on, by doing the partial, it helps them with weight balance. He uses that to sit on, to balance when he's running, when he's playing. You'll see his stump actually move. He's using it just like he still has the full limb, and it really does help him with coordination and function. So absolutely partial amputation, whether using a prosthesis or not, I'd recommend. Now we talked about supplements. 
We talked about myos for muscle mass. What else can you do to keep your dog, your tripod, comfortable? What else can you do? Well, there's a new device that's just coming out that's by Paul Wave, and this is a massage therapy wand specifically made for dogs. And there's different types of heads, depending on if you're using it for the back or for the shoulder. And this particular thing, we're trying to keep this area comfortable. Why? Because they will get trigger points, they'll get spasms. Again, we're trying to maintain the muscle mass and function. Um, and so you can see we wanna keep those muscles comfortable, we wanna keep them relaxed. And so this is a great device, not only if your dog's had an amputation, just if you have a dog in general, think of us. We go to get massages. We use massage guns, massage therapy wands. They really appreciate it as well. You can see he's moving his legs saying, hey, I want some more of that. And so uh, they tolerate it quite well. There's different heads that go on this device um, for different areas of the body. But you can see Armani's just sitting here chilling. We've even used it on our cat. And so uh, so they, uh, you know, once they get used to the the sound and the feel, they're like, oh man, I really, really enjoy this. And, uh, and so especially with the dogs that have had the amputations, we're trying to keep those muscles functioning, comfortable, reducing trigger points, spasms, um, really something that we want to uh, consider. So if you haven't seen this before, this is something that's just launching. Here <laughs> is reaching out, asking for more. Um, this is something that's just about to launch. It's by a company called Paw Wave. Um, it is a pet massager. There's all these different types of um, device heads that, that are there for different sizes and shapes of dogs in different locations in their body. So stay tuned for that. You can go to our canapsportsmed.com page where we have... Um, pet products, um, everything from supplements to other types of devices, to dog beds, you name it. Um, these are products that we believe in that have been tested, um, proven that there is data that we use not only for our patients, but also for our own dogs. Um, but this will be launching and you can watch the companies just creating their website. Um, this is a human company that's, that's one of the leaders in the field of this type of technology for humans and they're launching these for dogs. And uh, we've, we've been able to beta test these in dogs and cats and different areas of their body. And um, really excited about this product coming out. So in conclusion, okay, external self-suspension prosthesis may be considered as a viable option for dogs requiring a distal limb amputation. Also, if your dogs had a full floor limb amputation, you saw now with 3D printing, we're able to actually make a full forelimb amputation device or prosthesis for these dogs to now ambulate. Requires careful patient and client selection, okay? This wasn't a silver bullet. We don't just do the procedure and hand you this device and say, put it on and go for a hike, okay? It's really a dedicated team approach between your veterinarian, your surgeon, your rehab therapist, your orthotist, all those people together. And of course you um, play the most important part as the owner. Um, and so when it comes to this, you know, I think it's absolutely something that we need to sit down and say, hey, the partial amputation, even if we don't use the prosthesis, they can use the rest of that extremity to help to sit, to lay, to balance, to, to roll over. Um, when running, hiking, they still have it there to help them kind of support the rest of their body and support the entire chain. Looking at our retrospective study, these were dogs that had that prosthesis on for quite a bit of time, and you could see that statistically significantly, owners were satisfied, and we didn't see a significant amount of complications. But there's always gonna be some. There's gonna be soft tissue wounds. There's gonna be issues where it slips or slides. There's gonna be issues where sometimes the little device starts to uh, you know, bend or break on you, and you'll have to make some modifications, but that's to be expected. So for questions regarding these types of techniques um, or devices that are out there, um, please feel free to reach out to Elise Kardash. She's my research and development coordinator um, through our translational medicine company, Orthobiologic Innovations. If you're interested in anything regarding telemedicine, teleeducation, products that we talked about, feel free to go to canapsportsmed.com. So for this, we do telemedicine for owners, 
We do telemedicine for veterinarians. Say you have a challenging situation, you're a vet, and you want to run a, run a case by us, or you need help with a procedure, we actually have software. We can actually do the procedure with you, whether it's a surgery, rehab, ultrasound, you name it. For owners, you may have a dog that has a challenging condition, and you really want to learn more about what your options are. Or your vet hasn't been able to figure it out, but you have a lot of diagnostics, or you want to know which diagnostics you should have, or you want to see if you can find somewhere in your area of the world someone that can help you with your canine's condition or problems. So feel free to go to Canap Sports Med and reach out. With that, we have additional educational papers, we have videos, the products that we talked about, the different supplements as well as others are there. And there is a discount on these products as well. We really try to keep the prices down so that you guys can afford to actually utilize these types of products for your, your canine and feline companions. We have a wall of fame. These are some of the dogs that have had procedures from around the world that have gotten back to their sports and the fun things that they do. And we are about to include a concierge service with this as well. Um, you can see our coordinator, Allie, and that was her Great Dane that we looked at. Um, that's our daughter, Allie Knapp at sportsmed.com. And feel free to reach out to her for any of these types of things. So on behalf of the USM and Pathway Vet Alliance and OrthoBio and Knapp Sports Med and Project Go, we thank you and hope that this was helpful, educational, and may bring some insight as to things that you can do to help your tripod. Thank you so much. Stay safe and stay well. Many thanks to Dr. Knapp for letting us share this valuable information. Learn more about Dr. Knapp's work at VOSM.com. And tune in to part two of this webinar for our live Q&A session with answers to questions about tripods and prosthetics, how to care for our three-legged friends. Find many more videos and veterinarian interviews about prosthetics for three-legged dogs and cats at tripods.com. He's a three-legged dog and he's still pretty good.